In the early 1900s, a wooden roller coaster would be built in Memphis. When the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, lived just around the corner, he would become a huge fan of the ride. The Zippin' Pippin led the way to the creation of Memphis's most cherished theme park, where you can meet the Hound Dog, ride iconic coasters, and celebrate America. Not much is more American than Elvis, but perhaps a theme park built around the colonial period and the frontier that would later be abandoned would try to be. This is the story of Libertyland the home of Alvis's favorite roller coaster. In the United States, the typical fair began in the mid-1700s as agricultural markets. They became an annual celebration for the community to come together, learn, and share the best in agriculture and domestic products. One of the largest in the South would begin in 1856. The Shelby County Agricultural Society had come together to promote agriculture in the area and organized a fair to showcase farms, merchants, and businesses surrounding the growing city of Memphis, Tennessee. Located on the Mississippi River, and at the perfect location between rich agricultural states, its fair was well received and over 6,000 residents would attend in its first year. Showing the latest technology, the new fair found its permanent home in 1869, adjacent to the Midtown Memphis horse racing track. The fair became so important to Memphis that schools even finished early on the first Friday of the fair so children could attend. As the fair began to grow, the city of Memphis would purchase the land it sat on. Called Montgomery Park, they renamed the fair in 1912 as the Tri-State Fair, aiming to represent the visitors coming in from Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi. Through tough times, the fair would continue, even through World War I, and it was during this time, with the need for entertainment at an all-time high, that plans would be drawn up to make way for an amusement park on the site. This wouldn't be the first park for Memphis. A few decades earlier, a small park named East End Park had already been successful in Memphis. Built in the mid-1890s as a destination for those riding the East End Railway Company's new trolley, which had been completed in 1887, guests could take the trolley and spend time at the park's lake, dance the night away in the dance hall, enjoy a beer garden and the promise of alcohol, and eventually ride Memphis's very first roller coaster. In 1904, talk began with excitement for the upcoming new amusement attractions. The most important of which was this new roller coaster, which at the time was called one of the most pleasant and exciting of sports. The new coaster was a cutting edge side friction roller coaster made from pine. East End Park's end came when prohibition made liquor sales illegal and the beer garden was forced to close, taking the party out of the site. After the closure, the Pinewood roller coaster was dismantled, and there were rumors that it was not going to be the end for Memphis's first permanent roller coaster. In September 1923, the Tri State Fair would open its gates as usual to the public, showcasing a great and more instructive line of commodities that had ever been gotten together since the institution was established 16 years ago. They had spent $50,000 on new amusement features. These new features constructed for amusements of old and young included a merry-go-round, shooting gallery, a house of mystery, an old mill, and one of the largest roller coasters in the area. That some speculated that it was built using the very same pine that the original had dismantled at East End Park, with new technology now in place. This year, the fair would now be called the largest permanent recreation park in the South, with the attractions found in a new area called Joy Plaza. The roller coaster, named the Pippin, would be designed by John A. Miller under contract to Lynn Welcher, who was a popular concessionaire and owned many of the attractions at fairgrounds, along with multiple roller coasters at different state fairs in the South. The new additions were a huge success, and it was in the following years further attractions were introduced. In 1928, a huge storm damaged much of the classic wooden coaster, and it would be rebuilt taller and longer than ever, now at over 2,500 feet. The Pippin became iconic, and was the fair's most popular attraction, 
every single year. The Tri-State Fair did not take place during World War II. Following the war, in 1946, the city of Memphis purchased the attractions at the fair from concessionaire owners, including the Pippin. During the closed season, the fair's grounds had been used as camps for the war, and before it reopened in 1947, many improvements and repairs were made, and finally, once again, there was a huge hope for the future. Too soon, the rides are over. And too soon, all the fun comes to an end. But our friends are very happy. They've had a wonderful day at the fair. During 1956, the fair celebrated its 100th year. The highlight for many at the special celebration, though, will be a surprise appearance by none other than a young Elvis Presley. Elvis moved to Memphis in 1946, and after the fair had opened following the war, he became a huge fan of the place, particularly the Pippin roller coaster and his all-time favorite attraction, the Dodgems. As his fame was beginning to grow, he would often rent out the coaster at night and ride it multiple times with friends. It was said that Alvis liked the first car or the back car of the coaster. He said there was no thrill in the others. They would rent out the rides riding the coaster as many times as possible until the sun came up. Two decades later, in 1971, the Mid-South Fair had a new idea. A multi-million dollar theme park on the site of the fairgrounds in the style of a Six Flags. Lee Winchester, fair president, said it was expected to cost between 15 to 30 million dollars and it would be built at no cost to taxpayers. The idea had started for the new park and it was to be called Liberty Land, built in stages with the full operation complete by July 4, 1976, the date of the nation's bicentennial. The plan was to inaugurate the attraction with an Independence Day parade that would become an annual affair. The proposal was exciting and met with promise. As for what would be built, the plans were said to include a monorail, sky chairs, horse-drawn street railway cars, a huge train, and a focus on the history of America. Planned themes would include Colonial Land, Davy Crockett, Bill Street Blues, the Mississippi River, Wild West, and Future Land. The aim was to promote tourism, entertainment, and patriotism. Right away, the plans were questioned and reported to be dropped for a much smaller entertainment center. A consulting firm studied the feasibility of the $20 million project and found that it could not be supported by the Memphis tourism market. However, a small $6 million project was suggested instead that could potentially attract up to 500,000 people and much of what was originally said to be coming would have to be cut. Instead, a condensed theme park would be planned. To design the project, the fair team enlisted the talents of someone with experience, Randall Dool and Associates. The design would feature his classic lake in the center, and it was designed to fit all around the Pippin roller coaster and the carousel, which would remain. These two would be the only elements carried over from the fairgrounds. As you entered the park, you would still be greeted with Colonial Land, home to the Bow Tavern Theater, the Liberty Bow, which was helped funded by students and Boy Scouts, and a train station. Just a small train station. The center of the park, with its central river, would feature Tom Sawyer, near the turn of the Century Land. This would be where you would find the classic style thrill rides such as the Scrambler and the refurbished classic roller coaster, now with a new name, the Zippin' Pippin'. That antique classic carousel which began in Chicago and had sat at the site here since 1923 was also fully refurbished. Tom Sawyer's Island would be a peaceful escape on an island in the center that visitors could access with floating barrel bridges. This might sound somewhat familiar, and this could be because Randall Dool had previously worked for C.V. Wood, former friend of Walt Disney and general manager slash designer of the Disneyland project. They had previously worked together on the design of Freedomland USA before Dool had left to form his own company. 
Frontierland would celebrate the nation's spirit of exploration and expansion. Historic log cabins would be purchased to be included in this section. Frontierland would also be home to a 40-foot tall old hickory log flume and a petting zoo, a 300-seat amphitheater, as well as a dolphin show. Jack Morris, Fair Secretary at the time and the main driving force behind the project, said that they estimated attendance would average 5,000 each weekday with 8,000 at the weekends during the six months that the park would plan to be open on its first year. They would charge $4 per person to experience Liberty Land's 13 rides, and they expected it to be a huge success. Not everybody was convinced though. There were concerns and delays that were cited due to the energy crisis hitting the nation, but Jack Morris ensured that only 2% of visitors would be tourists. Still, many had doubts, thinking it was the wrong time and wrong place for the park. Those doubts continued, but the reduced sizing of the park did make it seem somewhat feasible. Eventually, the bonds for the creation of Liberty Land were approved. The $7 million bond would be split 60-40 between the city and county, and construction would soon be underway. Everything surrounding the carousel, which was slightly moved, and the Pippin coaster was flattened, and quickly, the new designs came to life. Consulting engineer H.S. Hall Lewis oversaw the construction, with the biggest project being the $560,000 log flume that was set to become the new Anchor Thrill Ride. In the center would be a replica of the Statue of Liberty, standing at eight and a half feet. This statue had previously sat alongside Rainbow Lake, but was removed due to vandalism in Overston Park and moved to the Liberty Land River. Liberty Land officials had to ask the Shelby County Court for a further $1.3 million to complete the theme park. The park was going to cost much more than their estimated $7 million to complete. They said this was because of inflation and the fact they had decided now to buy all the rides for the park rather than lease them. Further costs including refurbishing the Pippin, which cost three times as much as estimated at $150,000. Liberty Land would first approach the county for the extra costs as a loan, as the city had already paid more for the attraction. Liberty Land was somewhat unique as it would be one of the only theme parks in the country financed by a city and a county. The request for more money did not help persuade those who were already skeptical about the park. However, the court committees backed the new bonds and recommended authorizing the additional funds after a presentation by Mid-South Fair. Liberty Land would now cost $8.3 million. This would be repaid when the park was expected to start making a profit in year three. The annual debt service on the bonds would be around $723,000. They hoped that in 1977, they would be able to make more than this and expected $1.2 million. As the finishing touches were added, on opening, the park would feature 13 rides, four live shows, and numerous shopping locations built within the three themed section of Colonial Days, Pioneer Times, and Turn of the Century. Live entertainment and roaming actors would be a staple, all recruited from the local area, making Mid-South Fair the biggest employer in the city. Liberty Land was built to complement the fair, not replace it, as the fair would continue each year as before, along with the new seasonal park. The park's manager stated that Liberty Land would be one of the greatest things to ever hit Memphis. No one would ever be sorry that it was there. <laughs> Liberty Land was planned to soft open on May 22, 1976, to get ready in time for the big celebration on July 4. A strike by construction workers would delay the soft opening, along with accusations that racial bias entered into the park's hiring practices, which the park denied. Liberty Land scrambled to make the 200-year anniversary of the country 
and the grand opening of Liberty Land was eventually set for July 3rd and 4th with a fireworks celebration and a dedication by Barbara Bonnyfield, a direct descendant of President John Adams, who would ring the reproduction of the Liberty Bow. The first people to experience the park a few days early would be the people who helped build and plan the place. For opening weekend, the park would be open from 10 a.m. to midnight, with its regular hours aiming to be 10 a.m. to 11 p.m. Memphis had a new mini theme park, and from the preview, it seemed to sparkle. On July 4th, 1976, 12,000 people visited Liberty Land to celebrate not only the brand new mini theme park, but America. People gathered together to see the shows, enjoy the sights, ride the ride, watch fireworks, get pistol whipped and robbed at the entrance, and celebrate 200 years of the USA. Liberty Land seemed like a hit. People were so excited they were trying to rip the tails off the merry-go-round horses. The response was the park and the caliber of the rides and entertainment was as fine as one could find anywhere. The $5 fee to enter and ride everything was loved. The log flume was an instant hit with locals, and the park promised they would add more landscaping and shade as it looked a little barren on opening. That 2% expected tourism from outside Memphis was actually closer to 20%, and most comments about the opening focused on how everything was smaller than its competitor parks, the train, the park in general, but one comment came up every time about the employees' friendliness and the training, and that the shows were delightful. Liberty Land seemed to meet expectations, and everyone was leaving happy. As the yearly Mid-South Fair approached, Liberty Land would change its pricing fee during the nine-day fair. With both to operate right next to each other, the park would lower the entry fee to Liberty Land for $2 and give a coupon for one ride, putting a fee on the rides and shows with prices comparable to the fair. This was actually changed, and it was free entry to the park and paper ride, just like the fair. After the fair ended, the park tried to stay open an extra week, but demand was so low that only a few hundred people visited during the weekend. Liberty Land closed for the winter, and its opening was seen as a successful short season. As hoped for, 500,000 people had visited between July 4th and October 14th, the opening year was a success, and they promised next year they would be back stronger than ever. The second season focused on improving the food at the park with a new restaurant, a new movie was added, and the addition of a tunnel on the train. The park's second full season would begin on April 9th, 1977, and guests could not wait to come back and visit the park and take photos with its mascot, the Liberty Land Hound Dog. The Zippin' Pippin had a bright yellow coat of paint. Improvements had been made throughout multiple areas, and the promised addition of more shade was here. Hopes were high, and estimates were hoping for over 700,000 visitors this year. Elvis had remained a fan of the fairgrounds, just 15 minutes away from his home, and the now called Zippin' Pippin. On August 7th, 1977, he rented out the whole of the brand new Liberty Land Park for $2,700 overnight for his daughter Lisa Marie and her friends, who were at Graceland before the new school year started. He was set to end an 11-day tour soon with two shows at the Mid-South Coliseum Arena next to the fairgrounds. Before that though, a week after renting the theme park, Elvis Presley was tragically found dead. At his funeral, one of the people carrying his casket would be his close friend George Klein, a longtime DJ and promoter of Alvis, and current Liberty Land's marketing director. The park was in mourning following the announcement, and in the following seasons would always pay tribute to Alvis, who had loved the fairground attractions for years. Attendance stayed the same during the park's longer second season, which was seen as a good thing as some other parks around the country's attendance was down. They did not make enough money to pay the bonds, and they were $113,000 short. 
To try and fix this, the third season would restructure its submission policies and cut the season from 125 to 101 days. The entrance fee price would rise to 550 and children over two would now have to pay full price, as before under sixes were free. The park was averaging about 3,800 visitors a day, much lower than estimated, and to break even they needed 4,600 visitors a day on average. To try and do this, they would spend four times as much on national marketing as the previous year. For this year, the park would again add different shows and a kiddie land on Tom Sawyer's Island with part of the river filled in to add more room. By June, talk began of what to do to increase attendance. The rumor was another price hike would be needed and a further $1.5 million in bonds from the county court and the city as Liberty Land was planning something big. They were going to construct a loop corkscrew thrill ride. If it was approved, the park believed that they would never have to ask for money again, that this new ride would generate enough revenue alone that it would pay for itself within five years and turn the park into a profit. Once again, the request was approved for this super ride at the park. Newspapers were reporting that coaster maniacs were lining up to ride the new breed of screen machines around the country and they would flock here. Liberty Land said that this was a one-off and its smallness was its greatest asset. By not making continuing big investments like this, Liberty Land would be here to stay for decades and make a profit. They didn't really mention that the real reason was because the park was being financed with public money and it was just not possible to add many big attractions. Made by Aerodynamics in California, the new roller coaster will be placed on the southeast end of the park and be included with park emission. The coaster will be called the Revolution and hopes will be high that it would finally bring the park into profit. The ride was built and created, but Liberty Land had an issue. They didn't have enough money to construct it at the park. Once again, they had to ask for a further $238,000 so it could be put up. Again, they said the cost went up by the time they asked for funding, and as before, the city and the council approved this further funding. Liberty, it turns out, is expensive. But for the first time, ahead of projections, Liberty Land had finally made a profit at the end of the season and was able to start paying its debts. During the winter months, the park held a winter festival for the first time and the revolution was getting ready they also would add an Alvis tribute show. The park opened for 1979 without the coaster complete, which would be ready to go by June 2nd. While the season started similar to the one before, after the new coaster opened, attendance at the small theme park was up 20%, and 1979 would be the park's best season yet. The addition of the huge coaster to complement the Pippin had worked, while the gas shortage was hurting major parks around the country, Liberty Land with its local audience was not affected at all. In fact, more people were staying home and it helped them see more visitors than ever. While the park would continue to add attractions over the next decade, nothing again would match the size and scale of the revolution. Throughout the 80s, park emission continued to rise, yet Liberty Land struggled year by year to pay back the money it owed. Attendance would drop in 1982, and the park officials got permission to drop its interest payments on the bonds to $500,000 for three years. Then, the park said it would not be able to pay any more than $200,000 per year, and it was dropped again by the city and county. During the 1982 season for the TV show That's Incredible, one of the Revolution's trains were retrofitted so that Dave Cox could ski through the track. Despite its financial issues, many in the city continued to back the park. It was a great place for the community and employed thousands of teenagers to work there every summer. While it was struggling to pay back what it was owed, it was deemed that Liberty Land was a valuable asset regardless and it should remain for the people of Memphis despite its continued struggle with profits and attendance throughout the years. Into the 90s, the park struggled its two major roller coasters still thrilling those who visited, along with the new smaller additions. But by 1992, as the park had its lowest numbers visiting yet, it was clear to Mid-South Fair that Liberty Land would never generate the revenues it was projected to before opening 
and they would continue to have to rely on profits generated by the annual fair to subsidize its operation. The city and the county had reduced the payments to a minimum to make sure the fair could continue each year for residents and Libertyland could continue to employ hundreds of teenagers every year. I can work my way to Bobcat. Ride that thing? Forget it. Come on, Daddy! Come on, Daddy! One price to pay for the whole day All the rides, all the shows, and on and on it goes Liberty Land, Liberty Land Wonderful, wonderful Liberty Land Liberty Land Liberty Land would continue, each year losing money and the Mid-South Fair profits continued being used to keep it running. The park was still putting on great shows, keeping its rides maintained, and the classic wooden roller coaster was still running. However, it wasn't enough to bring people in, and attendance was now under 250,000 per year. This cycle continued, of barely scraping by, until 2005. After Liberty Land was closed for the season as normal in early November, Liberty Land's executive officers recommended closing the amusement park that once thrilled Elvis Presley. The board stated that the only way we would be able to turn it around would be to put capital improvement dollars into new rides, and that's something they could not do with the debt that they had. The fair's future at the site would also be questioned, but for now it would continue as planned. The park had stayed open for over two decades now, barely making any profit, but because many people believed it was doing good for the community and giving good, safe jobs to the young people of Memphis, it was allowed to stay around. The closure announcement hurt everyone involved. Liberty Land's last day of operation was October 29, 2005. Nobody leaving the park that day even realized it would be the last. Many questions remained, and the biggest question? What would happen to the ancient roller coaster that was the centerpiece of the area for so long, the Zippin' Pippin, an icon to so many growing up around Memphis? Whatever happened, there were many, many people who would try to save the Pippin. Right away, groups formed to try and protect the future of the theme park. Hailing it as an important piece of Memphis history. The Save Liberty Land group would attempt to recruit potential new operators to reopen the theme park. The problem was, fair officials already planned to auction the rides and equipment from the park, including the coaster and antique carousels, and an auction was set for June 21st, 2006. Many looked to Graceland to purchase the Pippin and save Alvis's favorite coaster, but they shot down the idea and said that a theme park ride was just not fitting for the plans for the property. Surprisingly, the auction of the Pippin and Grand Carousel was stopped before it happened as the city was claiming ownership of them. Mid-South Fair would have to prove they had ownership to sell the attractions at the closed park. The outcome was that the city owned the Grand Carousel and it would not be sold, but the fair would keep and be able to sell the Pippin. The Save Liberty Land group urged them to halt the auction and wait, but the auction went ahead. The recently added drop tower went to Ghost Town in the Sky. It operated for one season, offering amazing views at the top of the mountain, until Ghost Town was closed and left abandoned. The million dollar Revolution roller coaster sold for $55,000 and went to Del Grosso's amusement park in Pennsylvania. The Revolution was never rebuilt at this park and sat in a field until the summer of 2011 when it was sold and built at a park in the Philippines. The iconic Zippin' Pippin was sold for just $2,500 to a small rock museum who only really wanted the front train car that Alvis used to love riding in to display. Liberty Land was no more, and what wasn't sold was just left at the site abandoned, including the iconic log flume. The last Mid-South Fair at the city-owned fairgrounds was in September 2008 after the city of Memphis did not renew the lease. From 2009, the fair was held in Mississippi. One of the requirements for buying the Pippin was that it had to be removed within 30 days. The new owners, after taking Alvis's favorite car from the train, planned to list the remains of the ride on eBay. They hoped someone would have the space to move it and take it down to preserve it as part of Americana. 
The roller coaster was reported to be sold to the Tourism Bureau in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, and it would be used as part of the Carolina Crossroads Tourism Project. Before the sale, interest also came from Dolly Parton, but Dollywood said they would have to spend millions to rearrange the park to fit the roller coaster within it. So it went to her brother's project, Carolina Crossroads, instead, as part of its planned rock and roll amusement park. As Libertyland sat abandoned, much of the copper wiring inside was stolen. The Pippin and the Carousel sat in the park, with the future still uncertain on when they would leave. There was some hope, as Joyland Amusement Park had issued a letter of intent to rebuild a new park on the site. This was dropped, however, when the state of the remains of the park and its missing wiring was discovered. The next year, in 2007, Carolina Crossroads announced plans to donate the Zippin' Pippin' roller coaster to the Save Liberty Land group. They kept one of the cars to keep on display, but the group had convinced them that the Pippet was essential to their plans to save Liberty Land, and they would have the rights to rebuild a replica at their park in North Carolina instead. The Save Liberty Land group still hoped to reopen the park around the Pippin and the Grand Carousel had been restored, and they had a chance again to save Memphis history. The roller coaster would now be on the National Historic Register. When Joyland pulled out, the new plan was to donate the Pippin so it could be relocated and renovated at Mud Island and the Pyramid. By 2009, the site remained the same. The city were claiming ownership of the Pippin, as it still had not been removed from the site. The Pyramid project had gone in a different direction, and the city was finally ready to begin demolition of Liberty Land. The antique carousel was finally removed and put into storage, and demolition crews tore out a section of the Pippin to see if the famous coaster was even salvageable. What they found was not promising. After years of sitting abandoned in the park, most of it was rotten. The Grand Carousel was later restored, and has been in operation at the Children's Museum of Memphis, just around the corner from where the theme park used to be. Liberty Land was demolished, and much of its area was used as a parking lot and green space until in 2022, when a youth sports complex was built on part of the property. A sign was erected in 2010 to celebrate the history of a place that was no more. Patriotic, American-inspired theme parks have been proposed multiple times over the last century. Some built, some designed, some cancelled, and some, even to this day, are in the plans. Liberty Land, for many though, was special, providing summer jobs to thousands of Memphis youths over the years and left lasting memories for those who visited throughout its 29 years of existence. While Liberty Land would be remembered fondly, it would be its roller coaster that predated it by decades, the Zippin' Pippin, that would be its real star, providing special memories for so many since the early 1900s, including Elvis Presley himself. With the demolition of Liberty Land, the story of Elvis's favorite roller coaster didn't end. Over 100 years after its creation, its legacy still stands today. Not in Memphis, where the king rode it, but somewhere else. In January 2010, crews began dismantling the Zippin' Pippin' roller coaster to make way for the site's redevelopment. At first, the coaster was taken down piece by piece, with care and hope that its parts could be preserved. When this seemed to not be the case, more and more of it was torn down haphazardly, and much of it collapsed. I guess you could say, it was all shook up. As the demolition was underway, it was suddenly halted. Surprisingly, the mayor of Green Bay, Wisconsin, wanted to buy the iconic roller coaster. South's most famous roller coaster could be on its way to the frozen north. 
Green Bay, Wisconsin is in talks with Memphis to become the new home of the Zippin' Pippin'. City and county politicians say the city can't afford to renovate the ride and this trip to the upper Midwest may be the roller coaster's best hope. The history of the ride was very important to them and along with the Save Liberty Land group, who had been fighting for years to save the attraction, they would aim to honor it and help out. He says the Zippin' Pippin' will be built from 100% new materials. The city is paying about $10,000 for the name, design, and history of the roller coaster. After inspecting the rotten wood, which was deemed unusable and was now mostly torn down, the mayor of Green Bay purchased the rights to all the Zippin' Pippin' materials, the name, and the configuration of the coaster, along with anything that was remaining unusable. It was approved that Green Bay would spend $3.8 million to create a rep replica of the iconic coaster using all new materials and parts from the defunct Pigeon Forge wooden coaster Thunder Eagle. The replica opened on May 21st, 2011, an instant hit just like it had been nearly 100 years before. Since the new version opened, millions more riders have now got to experience the iconic roller coaster and many can't help falling in love with it all over again. In honor of the original, those visiting from Memphis would be able to ride the new roller coaster for free. Liberty Land may be but a memory, but a Bay Beach Park in Wisconsin, in name and in spirit, Elvis Presley's favorite roller coaster, the Zippin' Pippin', lives on. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Expedition Extinct. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to join the expedition. Follow us on social media for updates on upcoming attractions and a special thank you to our Patreons for supporting the channel. We will see you next time.